Welcome back to Module 6. In this video, we're going to be talking about different types of galaxies, starting with the discovery of the fact that there was structures outside of the Milky Way galaxy that we've been learning about so far this module. So let's get started. Our story begins in the late 1700s, where we introduce Charles Messier, a French astronomer who was trying to find comets that he could put his name on and publicize. And so he would survey the sky with his uh, relatively low power telescope looking for new comets. And along the way, he would find other fuzzy things through his telescope that uh, he consistently saw in the same place, so he knew they weren't comets. And to make his own life easier, he made a clear catalog of what things he was finding um, that kind of initially looked like a uh, comet through his uh, low powered telescope and that he knew he wanted to rule out. And this list of um, over 100 objects is what resulted out of that. It's called the Messier Catalog. Objects have M numbers. And if you scan, um, there are some things that we have seen before in our slides. For example, M51 in our um, previous discussions from this module, we said that M51 is the Whirlpool Galaxy. It was a classic example of the self-sustaining star formation that happens in spiral arms. And if you look at M20, that's the Trifid Nebula, and we talked about that when we were talking about the different types of nebulae in the interstellar medium discussion um, at the start of Module 5. So this catalog is basically things that weren't individual stars, because those look like tiny points of light even through a um, low-powered telescope, that weren't planets, because those do move, but they are kind of very well known how they move, they're only in one band on our sky, the ecliptic. Uh, and then comets wouldn't have gone into this catalog either because he would have reported out and publicized them, and comets like planets don't stay in the same part of the sky. And as we look at all of this, these are objects that we've started to already learn about. A lot of them are star clusters. And in fact, we have discussed most of the objects in the catalog. There are 27 open star clusters, 29 globular star clusters, six diffuse nebulae, um, those are the emission nebula or reflection nebula that we talked about, four planetary nebulae, that's the end of a low mass star's lifetime, and 40 galaxies. There's a couple of other small things, one supernova remnant, um, one extra bright patch of the Milky Way, a double star, uh, and an asterism. But that 40 galaxies is highlighted for us here because we have not yet talked about the idea that other galaxies had to be discovered. Certainly Messier put them in his catalog. They were seen, but they weren't understood. So in the 1700s, those were called spiral nebulae. And they were called spiral nebulae throughout the 1700s and the 1800s and into the start of the 1900s as well. So even just 100 years ago, those galaxies were not known to be what we now understand as galaxies. The key thing was that we did not know how far away they were. Uh, if you've ever seen the, the movie Finding Nemo, where Dory um, tries to speak to a, a fish that seems very far away, and um, they realize that this is in fact a whale that's just much farther away than they anticipated. It's the same situation here. Until we knew how far away these objects were, they could have been much smaller spiral nebulae within our galaxy, uh, just star clusters that had a cool shape, rather than individual islands all their own. So I'm going to bring us to a great debate in 1920 between Harlow Shapley, whose name we have heard before, he was the um, the person who mapped out all of the globular clusters towards the beginning of our discussion of the Milky Way galaxy. And we introduce now Haber Curtis, who's actually born in Muskegon, Michigan, uh, and lived his life uh, in our grand state. And uh, they had a great debate in 1920 where they had two podiums on a stage, lots of people came to watch, and they had a lot of things to say over several hours. Uh, and if we distill down their key points, um, far simpler than they would have wanted, but if we distill down their key points, um, there are two statements on the slide. And a pause and think question for you is, who of these two scientists do you agree with, if either, and why? 
So pause the video to decide if you agree with either of these folks and then kind of write down a couple of thoughts on why um, you think they're right or um, why you think they're wrong. So pause the video to think through it. All right, so one of the things I want us to recognize is it's possible to be partially right, but if we still have something wrong, we have to identify that. So Harlow Shapley, let's read his statement out loud. We are near the edge of the Milky Way, which is huge and contains all of the spiral nebulae within it. His map did show us that we're near the edge of the Milky Way. Our updated maps show us that we are much closer to the edge than the center. However, I've already given away the fact that there are other galaxies out there. Uh, these spiral nebulae are much bigger and much farther away than they knew about in 1920. So he's partially right, but we can't agree with him. And then Haber Curtis says that we are near the center of the Milky Way, which is small, and those objects are spiral galaxies outside of our own. Now, the sun is not in the central bulge. It is not close to the center. Uh, so Haber Curtis didn't agree with Harlow Shapley's maps way back at that point. Uh, and so Although he is correct that the spiral galaxies are outside, he's partially incorrect, so we can't agree with him either. So they both have something that's on track, but we cannot agree with either of these statements. So, although this beautiful debate happened in 1920 and um, everyone went away kind of disappointed because no one had the clear answers, it was only three more years before definitive proof came in to rule out the idea that the spiral, spiral nebulae we were seeing were part of our own galaxy. So Edwin Hubble, for whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named, identified a Cepheid variable, we've learned about those previously, in Andromeda Galaxy. He had been studying nova events, the um, end result of a white dwarf in a binary system, and he'd been dis uh, identifying several nova in that region, which he thought of as a spiral nebula, and realized that one of them, with, with more follow-up information, was clearly a variable star, a Cepheid variable that had the periods of brightening and dimming exactly like the others of its category. So using the recently calibrated period luminosity relationship, he realized that the distance to Andromeda Galaxy had to be at least 900,000 light years. His calculations were off because the period luminosity relation was quite new, but it was still enough that we knew it could not be part of um, the Milky Way Galaxy. What we now know is Andromeda Galaxy is 2.5 million light years away it is also heading in our direction, but it is its own entity, its own um, island of hundreds of billions of stars. So let's talk about the different types of galaxies that are out there. I want to start with one of my favorites, M51. And one of the reasons why I like it so much is back when I was a, a teaching assistant in graduate school, uh, students in a night lab and I uh, had extra time, so we had already done the observations we needed to of a binary, uh, eclipsing binary system. And so we, we had the telescope, we had the time, so we just took a quick, um, like, five-minute uh, exposure of the Whirlpool Galaxy, just one single image, not different wavelengths. Uh, and it was so interesting to see the shape already start to appear, um, even with this relatively simple uh, exposure and across the river from um, a big city where we have lots of light pollution. Of course, we know all of the different reasons why a space-based telescope is more powerful, and so when we take this same picture with the Hubble um, Space Telescope, certainly um, we're going to get something more impressive. So this has multiple wavelengths added together to enhance structure and color. It has no need for um, light pollution issues. It doesn't have a um, seeing limit, resolution limit from Earth's atmosphere, and the exposure is a much longer period of time. This is a classic spiral galaxy, an unbarred spiral galaxy. That central region is circular. It has a secondary galaxy that it's interacting with, but the main galaxy is, um, is a very classic unbarred spiral. 
Spiral galaxies of any type are the most recognizable. On the left, we have a very intense bar, central bar within a barred spiral galaxy. So um, on the left, NGC 1300, that is a more intense central bar than what our Milky Way galaxy has. Uh, it is still the same category as our Milky Way galaxy. And on the right, we have NGC uh, 1055, these are just catalog numbers. Um, and we can tell that it's still a spiral galaxy because it has that disk shape and we can see the presence of gas and dust. The dust is blocking our view. And that disk is extremely relevant to defining a spiral galaxy. So even if we can't see the spiral arms, we can still tell spiral galaxies have a, um, a disk that most of the material, especially all of the gas and dust, can be found in. Spirals are not the only type of galaxy, though. Uh, the other main category of galaxy is an elliptical galaxy. On the left, we have a giant elliptical galaxy. And what we'll recognize is that it's kind of boring, right? If we're going to draw a galaxy, we're going to draw a fun spiral doodle shape. We're not going to draw just a blob of light. Giant elliptical galaxies can get a lot bigger than the Milky Way galaxy, and they tend to be because of um, mergers of similar sized galaxies where all of the gas and dust is kind of used up in stars or, or lost, and all of the nice disk shape is just messed up within that merger, and we just end up with a blob of stars. On the right, we have a dwarf spheroidal galaxy, so elliptical and spheroidal are similar descriptions that there's not a disk, there's just a blob of stars. Um, and so we can have big ones and small ones, but these blobs of stars do not have a flattened part that uh, spirals are known for. And then those two main categories can't capture everything. The Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud are both dwarf irregular galaxies that orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. So they are their own entity. They are outside of the um, halo of the Milky Way galaxy. They contain um, fewer stars than a typical galaxy, which is why they're called dwarf. Um, and you can tell there's, uh, so they're on the left side of this image. You can tell that they have this diffuse glow, but it also seems like they might have some gas and dust, and that makes them not really fit the category of elliptical or spheroidal. They're irregular, the kind of leftovers. So in general, besides the irregular galaxies that are more interesting um, because they're doing their own thing, the two main types of galaxies that most galaxies of um, a certain size and above will fall into are spiral galaxies that have a lot of gas and dust, which means they can have ongoing star formation. That means we see all of the different types of stars because the young ones that uh, the young O and B stars that don't live a long time have this opportunity to be in the process of forming. Uh, and so there's this net rotation in the disk, which is where the star formation is happening because those spiral arms are self-sustaining star formation regions. Elliptical galaxies are not making new stars. They're kind of the, the leftover, just doing their thing. The stars that are there will live their lives, then they'll explode or they'll make planetary nebulae and they'll just kind of fade away. They don't have gas and dust to make new stars. Um, what we see in those galaxies tends to be the lower half of the HR diagram main sequence. So older stars, redder stars, we've lost all the O and B stars, they, they didn't live very long. And there's no net rotation because there's all of the different orbits and all of the different directions, similar to the central bulge of the Milky Way galaxy, where there's a lot of chaos and all sorts of different orbits. Now I want us to think a little bit about if we were to observe a galaxy that is full of red stars, what that means for the galaxy. So pause the video to read through all of the options and unpause when you're ready with your answer. All right, now uh, for option one, we do want to acknowledge that dust will uh, scatter blue light, it will make stars look redder, um, but it isn't going to uh, just make all of the stars look the same general color. When we have these galaxies that are populated by red stars, we are saying that um, we have been able to use all the different parts of the spectrum to confirm that these are low 
temperature stars, uh, not just stars that with our first visible light image look redder through interstellar reddening. So option one, I hear what you're um, thinking if you picked that one, but we're able to do follow-up observations that would show us those aren't red stars then. For option two, Blue stars that used to be present and aren't there anymore, that one sounds pretty good to us because the reason they're not present anymore is those blue main sequence stars die first. They would be the first ones to be gone and we wouldn't be seeing them anymore. So option two we feel pretty good about, but let's keep going through our critical thinking process on this one. Option three has been around long enough for blue stars to all evolve, sounds good so far, into the red main sequence stars we see. That's a big red flag. I know that we might have picked up on this idea that the blue stars evolve first, and that's great, but we have to think back to the HR diagram and how these stars move away from the main sequence. They do not shift along the main sequence. That is a big red flag for us. O and B stars on the main sequence don't become M stars on the main sequence. They become red supergiants. And that phase does not last very long either, then they explode. And then option four here never contained enough gas to have blue stars develop. Stars have a, um, a kind of frequency at which they form. Uh, it's called the um, IMF, the uh, initial mass function. There's a lot of studying that goes into what the most likely um, distribution of stars looks like. But there's no way for a galaxy to decide that it won't make blue stars. If it's going to make stars, it's going to make a range of stars. So our best answer here is option two. Um, there are things that we might have picked up on for each of these. It is a tough question. We're, we're well into the semester. We can handle tougher questions. Um, so if you got stuck by something, make a note of what you got tripped up by and um, maybe come back to this question with the posted slides. Uh, before quizzes or any other assessment. The other thing we want to talk about when we talk about types of galaxies is that um, Edwin Hubble, who had discovered the Cepheid variable in Andromeda Galaxy, as he started to categorize uh, galaxies, he created this diagram that we kind of now refer to as Hubble's tuning fork diagram. If you've ever seen a tuning fork in music, uh, it has this shape. Uh, some people call it a wishbone uh, diagram as well, but tuning fork is the one that uh, astronomy uses. Hubble's big idea, incorrect, but Hubble's big idea was that uh, galaxies start as ellipticals and then evolve into more exciting shapes, um, spirals uh, or barred spirals. That does not work. The information that we have so far from these slides, the ellipticals being older, the fact that they don't have gas and dust is telling us that they don't have the ability to evolve into anything exciting on their own. And spirals have this self-sustaining structure. The flat disk of material isn't going to all of a sudden become chaotic. There's no direction that a single galaxy can move around on this. Instead, rather than Hubble's assumption that we evolve from ellipticals to spirals, the most common change that happens is if we have a major, um, a mi major merger, so two similarly sized galaxies, whether it's uh, two ellipticals, two spirals, a spiral and elliptical, if two similar sized galaxies merge together, they will often lose any structure they had and form a giant elliptical galaxy. The link here is to a computer simulation um, that I encourage you to, to watch on your own. The link is in the posted slides. So elliptical galaxies can definitely come out of mergers. And it is worth noting that that's going to happen to us. Uh, the Milky Way galaxy is on track to collide um, in about 3 billion years. I think earlier in the videos I said something like 5 instead. Oops. Uh, in 3 billion years, the Milky Way and Andromeda are on track to um, collide with each other. And then we will lose all of the exciting gas and dust uh, in the process, though. So um, the kind of artist conception two and three, we're going to make a ton of stars as big clouds of gas and dust hit each other. The giant molecular clouds make a whole bunch of stars. 
individual stars are not actually going to run into each other. There's so much empty space between stars that that simply won't happen. Uh, and so as this dance of gas and dust and star formation happens, uh, it's going to look really cool if we're still around to see it. But eventually when everything settles and the dust settles, um, there's just not going to be gas and dust left. There's going to be a bunch of stars in a blob and we'll be one of uh, hundreds of billions of stars in that blob. So uh, something to look forward to, maybe. Uh, certainly something to note is in the future, even though our discussion of the sun's evolution tells us that by by this point we're going to be we're going to be thinking about uh, the star the sun becoming a red giant, and um, probably we'll have to be thinking big picture and not just about our solar system. So we're going to end here. This uh, kind of finishes our discussion of individual galaxies. When we come back in the next section, we're going to be talking about how we measure larger and larger distances, including distances to galaxies, uh, so that we can set the stage for a discussion of the universe as a whole. And then we'll wrap up the module with a discussion of um, the potential for life out there. So there's a lot more in our module left, but this is kind of a natural pause point uh, in discussions of galaxies and the stuff beyond galaxies. So thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.